участники рабочей сессии по защите экосистем, управлению и устойчивому сельскому хозяйству. Дамы и господа, разрешите приветствовать вас на этой рабочей сессии, посвященной решению задач в сфере экосистем и сельском хозяйстве и поблагодарить организаторов за создание условий для нашей работы. Для меня большая честь сопредседательствовать на этой сессии, где участие представителей и экспертов в области экологии, сельского хозяйства, снижение риска бедствий гарантирует достижение поставленных задач. Позвольте объявить открытым работу нашей сессии. Уважаемые участники, как известно, нерациональное управление земельными ресурсами, снижение устойчивости экосистем и сельского хозяйства являются одним из наиболее значимых факторов риска бедствий. Для достижения целей Синдайской рамочной программы правительство стран, участниц Третьей Всемирной конференции, приняли обязательства по приоритетным действиям, в том числе и по внедрению комплексных подходов к управлению природными ресурсами. Роль экосистем в снижении риска бедствий хорошо известна. В рамках реализации Синдайской рамочной программы по восстановлению обезлесенных и деградированных земель необходимо сотрудничество в следующих областях. Это оценка и определение степени риска, восстановление экосистем и ее защита, а также устойчивое сельского хозяйства. Второе. Учет инфраструктуры, внедрение методов устойчивого управления природных ресурсов, планы развития и стратегии по снижению рисков бедствий и изменению климата. Третье. Привлечение инвестиций и партнеров в этой сфере. И повышение знания фермеров и других не пользователей по рациональному использованию водных и земельных ресурсов. Наша рабочая сессия сегодня рассмотрит усилия заинтересованных сторон для решения имевшихся проблем в сфере защиты экосистем, управлению и устойчивому сельскому хозяйству. Целями рабочей встречи являются рассмотрение вопроса, каким образом выбранные методы управления ресурсами сельского хозяйства и природной среды могут повысить устойчивость к рискам. Второе. Обмен опытом по уменьшению риска бедствий и повышению социально-экономической выгоды в сфере защиты экосистем, управлению устойчивым сельским хозяйством. И третье. Определение практических мер по созданию партнерства с участием многих заинтересованных сторон и повышению объемов инвестиций. А теперь, уважаемые дамы и господа, позвольте передать слово для дальнейшего ведения сессии госпоже Джейн Маджовик, генеральному директору Wetland International, который имеет большой опыт в этой сфере и является признанным экспертом. Please. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I'm honored to be co-chair of this session. I'd like to make just some introductory remarks to frame the topic uh, for this session, to give you some context, and hopefully to encourage your thoughts, because we're going to come back to you a couple of times during the session to ask for your contributions. So the growing demand for food, for, for fodder and fuel, is increasing the pressures on land and competition for natural resources. But at the same time, we have land degradation and loss of healthy ecosystems due to activities like deforestation and wetland drainage. And this is actually then reducing the amount of productive land available and increasing the exposure of farmers and fishers in communities to a, a range of natural hazards. And in extreme cases, land abandonment is happening, and this is uh, an increasing trend because of issues like soil erosion, soil loss, subsidence, nutrient depletion, salinization. 
And all of these processes are undermining the resilience of many of the poorest and most vulnerable communities in these agricultural landscapes. And it's increasingly acknowledged that there is a close link between food security and the condition of water-related ecosystems. And this was also picked up in the SDGs and the Sendai framework. And so increasingly, efforts are turning to encourage uh, smallholder farmers to manage agro-ecosystems. So agricultural systems which include ecosystems as, as part and parcel. Um, and to improve water management across whole landscapes as part of sustainable intensification of agriculture and climate resilient land use. So these are all issues that are highly relevant to disaster risk reduction. And these are the main reasons why through the Sendai framework, governments did prioritize improving natural resource management through the integration of ecosystems as part of the critical infrastructure that people depend on through agricultural systems. So there's actually an indicator for green infrastructure within the targets for reducing economic losses through disasters. So this issue of connecting ecosystems and agriculture, it's core to disaster risk reduction and it's core to this debate here in Cancun. And as my co-chair has mentioned, we're going to use this session to uh, explore some of the existing experience and mostly then we're going to spend time on bringing forward what we collectively see as the top priorities for scaling up good practice and how to sustain that in the future. So next I would like to uh, briefly introduce the illustrious panel we have who are going to help us in uh, bringing the issues to the fore and exploring uh, the experience. So perhaps I'll, I'll start uh, on my left with Mr. Adrian uh, Fitzgerald. He is the policy lead for climate change resilience in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Ireland and I think he's going to share with us some of his Irish experiences although uh, his department also supports this work uh, in developing countries. We're very honoured also to have Ms. Margareta Wallström who's currently President of the Swedish Red Cross but of course has many years of experience in the leadership team of UNISDR. And to her right we have Mr. Ronnie Granados who is the manager of the National Forest Institute in Guatemala. So our panelists will bring together a diverse range uh, of experience. But before we turn to our panel, uh, I would like to turn back to my co-chair because uh, His Excellency would like to share with us his experiences in Tajikistan. So. Уважаемые участники нашей встречи, одной из важных мер, направленных на повышение устойчивости сельскохозяйственных культур, является широкое использование средств защиты урожая от потерь. От потерь, в том числе от влияния стихийных бедствий, в частности городобитий. Проблем борьбы с градовыми явлениями в последние годы уделяет все больше внимания как в научном, так и в оперативном плане. Ежегодно городобития наносят мировой экономике ущерб, оцениваемый 5,2 миллиарда долларов США. Ввиду этого во многих странах проводятся исследования по физике когнитивных облаков и реализуются проекты по борьбе с градом. В борьбе с этим природным явлением – используются различные методы и технологии. Уважаемые дамы и господа, городобития, связанные с развитием конвективных облаков, наносят большой материальный ущерб народному хозяйству. Градом могут быть повреждены дома и постройки, нередки случаи гибели скота и домашней птицы. У растений град рассекает листья, стебли, сбивает плоды, ломает ветки. 
поврежденные градом растения легко уничтожаются болезнями и вредителями. Это приводит к снижению показателей сортности и урожайности сельскохозяйственной продукции, а в конечном счете к сокращению валового сбора. Средние потери урожая в результате градопития составляют 15-25%. Поэтому не случайно возник вопрос о противоградовой системе, в первую очередь в долинах Таджикистана, где отмечается наибольший ущерб от градобитий и выращиваются трудоемкие и в то же время жизненно необходимые сельскохозяйственной культуры, ценные там коловолокнистые сорта хлопчатника, виноград, герань, рис, овощи, фрукты и другие садовые культуры. Для эффективной борьбы с градом прежде всего необходимо точно знать, когда и где будут происходить процессы его образования. Поэтому первым шагом является сбор метеорологической информации с использованием автоматических зондов, летающих на больших высотах, фотосмиков облаков из космоса и создание компьютерных метеорологических моделей. Это дает возможность определить время и место формирования кучево-дождевых облаков, в которых и начинается процесс образования града. Борьба с градом основана на введении в облако специального реагента, обычно йодистого свинца или йодистого серебра, способствующего замораживанию переохлажденных капель. Это уменьшает размер града в 4-5 раз. Средствами доставки реагента Градовые облака являются специальные противоградовые ракеты или летательные аппараты. Для проведения противоградовых работ на защищаемой территории организуют противоградовые отряды. В 70-х годах прошлого века в Таджикистане были предприняты конкретные шаги по созданию противоградовой службы. В первые годы практика по предотвращению городобития носила как производственный, так и научно-исследовательский характер, что позволило выявлять степень распределения городовых явлений на территории страны, основные траектории перемещения городовых облаков, районы их зарождения и места наиболее эффективного воздействия на них. За период работы этих отрядов возможные площади городобития были сокращены на 80-90%. Ежегодно в нашей стране Защищаются от городобития площади 585 тысяч гектаров в районах Западного, Центрального и Южного Таджикистана. Уважаемые коллеги, потепление климата будет способствовать повышению опасности городобития в нашем регионе. Следовательно, назрела необходимость дальнейшего развития и модернизации противоградовой службы и предотвращения ущерба, который может причинить это опасное погодное явление – а также разработки новых технологий по борьбе с городобитием. В настоящее время наша сторона, правительство, занимаются над этими вопросами. Благодарю вас за внимание. And I mentioned in the uh, earlier introduction that we're going to come to, to you, to the audience, to really enable us to uh, draw some conclusions and actually even to make some recommendations. So there is an invitation to formulate by the end of this session some really specific, concrete recommendations on this topic which can be taken forward then in the Chair's conclusion. So my ambition is that we really come up with some excellent, concise, practical recommendations um, that will be taken up. So uh, the next part of this program is to provide some inspiration for that. So I'm, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to share their particular experiences on integrating ecosystems natural infrastructure into agricultural systems in different contexts and how that has related to, to benefit disaster risk reduction. Whilst they're doing that, please be inspired and also uh, think about what might be priorities that we should suggest to come forward as a result of this session.
priorities for action between now and the next global forum in two years' time. So after this session, I'm, I'm going to ask for a few contributions, which should just be very short, uh, suggestions of priorities, just a few words, a line, uh, no more explanation or speeches. So keep that in mind. Okay, I would like then to uh, turn to the panel. I, I think we should stick with, with ladies first uh, on this panel. Uh, Margarita, could you please share your thoughts on this topic? Thank you very much, Jane, and um, thanks for inviting me to speak here. Not an expert on the topic, I will share how I come to have some uh, strong sense of what we have here. Um, having worked with disasters for many years, and um, you know, eventually you start asking yourself questions, how come that the people who respond to flooding don't talk to the people who are experts on water and flooding? Why don't they come together and figure out how to, how to mitigate the flooding? That was my first question many years ago, and I got the usual answer as well, you know, we don't meet, we don't know each other, things like that. But um, when we started working with the process of the yoga framework for action, and then consulting on where we go with Sendai, we really had to look into um, understanding, in fact, having observed the crucial importance of how natural resource management can make or break disaster risk reduction. Nature is both a cause of disasters, but can also mitigate disasters, as we've said. So we start looking at to, um, how how come, where are the barriers that need to be removed and how do we, how is it possible to incentivize the communities of expertise on both sides? Is it through policies, etc.? So as you have seen, and I think Jane have already mentioned some critical opportunities that this conversation led to within the Sendai framework, both the targets uh, C and D, in fact, talk a lot about the resilient infrastructure, green infrastructure, and anticipate that we now should be ready to make full use of what, in fact, you have a really good understanding of is how to manage the natural resource systems for resilience and sustainability. But I think we are still, we are still in, um, in lack of how to take this forward. And uh, in fact, and I think the minister already commented on it, um, the economics incentives are not very well developed. We tend to talk, of course, as we should, about um, how to manage natural resources for the purpose of resilience, sustainable development, but we don't talk enough about the cost of not doing it and the benefits of doing it well. So incentivizing this through better economics, I think, is a critical factor. We heard about the agricultural losses in, in Tajikistan every year, and I'm sure we have similar stories from many other countries. Uh, a second point here is um, the pace of change is very rapid, and the change happened in many different areas. But as someone said in a different discussion today, the scale and systemic changes that are necessary for sustainability are not yet there, and they require a completely different approach from, from a, a, a governance perspective and from an activist perspective. So how to bring together uh, the groups that have so much expertise and already, in fact, have many examples that relate to what you do at local level. There are so many examples of collaboration with local governments, with communities, that we don't know enough about. They don't have enough high profile. So bringing these to the forefront and encouraging all those that see obstacles rather than opportunities by demonstrating that we already know how this can be done in a much more clear-cut manner. Second point is I discovered when we started looking into these ecosystems management, environmental issues, that 
the environmental community, and I apologize, don't feel hurt, but I found them a very isolated community. Maybe they thought they owned the original sustainable development agenda from the Rio conference, and the rest of us were late arrivals to this conversation. Now we have this with many other sectors, but it was particularly strong because you know, we worked with a group of people from the environmental community, and they felt isolated because no one really wanted to deal with the risk issues. I think this is now getting much better. We've had some years working on this, but it's still not quite there. So how can we continue to work on much better integration? The instruments are there, you know, the instruments on biodiversity, they have already included in their, in their um, frameworks, disaster risk reduction. So it is there, but it's in the practice and the implementation that we need to be much more concrete on how to do it. And that needs a lot of volunteer forces, I would say. Final point is, um, at least for now, um, and we had reasons to discuss this a lot with the colleagues working on ecosystem sustainability, the language that we use. They felt that they could not get across to non-experts what it actually means. How do you describe this area, which is quite complicated, but certainly we should be able to be much more clearer in how we talk about it. So for now, that's what I have found and some of my implicit wishes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those inspirational words, Margarita. There's uh, a lot of great points in there. I like especially the last one, that we need to speak in a, a simpler and more concrete and clear language, especially if we need to work across sectors. Um, I think that all sectors have been guilty of nurturing their own language. So it's a very nice point. Um, which leads me to suggest that um, we should switch languages now and uh, ask Mr. Ronnie Granadas to make, uh, to make your intervention, which I believe will be in Spanish. So please use your headphones if you need to. Um, please share your experiences. Uh, I think you're going to talk about agroforestry experiences in particular from Guatemala. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Bueno, desde el punto de vista, bueno, perdón, vengo de Guatemala. Eh, como ya me presentaron, soy el director de, del Instituto Forestal de Guatemala. Como todos saben, desde el punto de vista de su exposición por el clima, eventos extremos, influencia de fenómenos climáticos como lo son el niño y la niña, las tormentas, etcétera, con una alta sensibilidad debido a condiciones estructurales, debido a la pobreza, degradación de ecosistemas, inseguridad alimentaria, aún bajo desarrollo rural y su baja capacidad adaptiva, Guatemala es un país altamente vulnerable ubicado en la lista de los 10 países más de más vulnerabilidad a nivel nacional, a nivel mundial, perdón. La, la población se ve afectada por la falta de protección de gestión de desastres. En Guatemala, una de las eh, poblaciones en los últimos años más afectada es la del corredor seco oriental. Eh, Esto, eh, esta zona está muy eh, afectada por los, por los cambios climáticos, por el cambio climático. Las sequías han producido pérdidas en los cultivos de maíz y frijol, que es el producto del sustento diario de, de la población, lo que compromete la situación alimentaria de las familias más pobres de la zona, aumentando los casos de desnutrición en los niños menores de 5 años. La agricultura es uno de, los, eh, de las actividades más, más afectadas con el cambio climático. El, el agricultor 
no solo depende de la agricultura en tierra, también es el, el pescador, el ganadero, eh, tiene varias actividades, la pesca, los bosques, dependen de ello. A nivel nacional, uno de los principales cambios en el uso de la tierra es la conversión de la vegetación natural. Quitamos los bosques para producir eh, cultivos agrícolas, principalmente en tierras de producción donde se pueda eh, eh, generar maíz y frijol y algunos pastoreos para el ganado. La práctica de la agricultura, como es la rosa y la quema, ha llevado a, a una degradación cada día más grande a nuestros suelos, eh, la reducción de la materia orgánica, la erosión, los problemas de degradación de la tierra y la desertificación han aumentado con la variabilidad y el cambio climático. A nivel nacional, en el sector agrícola y forestal, estamos tratando de contribuir a reducir esta vulnerabilidad a través del fomento de prácticas y arreglos agroforestales. Un ejemplo de ello eh, que podemos mencionar son los sistemas agroforestales como lo son el cuxurrum, que es una mezcla de, de, de bosque, de árboles dispersos y eh, líneas de cultivos agrícolas como lo son el maíz, el frijol y otros cultivos eh, eh, de, de rápido crecimiento, cultivos agrícolas más que todo. Esto viene a ayudar eh, no solo al, al mejoramiento de, de los suelos, porque toda la materia orgánica es la que utilizamos para dicho sistema agroforestal, eh, eh, residuos de cultivos antiguos lo reutilizamos como abonos orgánicos, entonces esto viene a generar eh, materia orgánica y eh, conservación del suelo. Otro, otro cultivo agroforestal lo tenemos como el alirramón, que es la mezcla de, del, del árbol ramón que sirve, eh, nos provee muchos nutrientes, no, nos provee muchos alimentos como son harinas, como es ganado, eh, comida para ganado por medio de la, del follaje. Esto lo mezclamos con cultivos agrícolas con, como son la plátano, la yuca, camote y algunos cultivos eh, subterráneos o cultivos agrícolas. Entonces, eh, ahí mezclamos los dos, las dos eh, fuentes de alimento, producimos leña, producimos madera y producimos comestibles como lo son los productos agrícolas. Gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Granados. Um, I think we will come back to you later to explore how these good practices have been, uh, have been scaled up in, in your country. But uh, you've given us at least a flavor of the, the mechanisms and approaches uh, to tackle what seems a, a very uh, severe uh, situation of environmental degradation, climate change, really undermining food security. Thank you for that uh, example. And finally, I'd like to turn to Adrian Fitzgerald to uh, give us your experiences. I think from, from Ireland, am I right, Adrian? Mostly uh, you focus on your homeland experiences. Yes. Yep. Um, thank you very much. It's very, very interesting to hear uh, the experience of Tihikistan and in Guatemala. And uh, in, in, in our case, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some initial experiences that we have in Ireland and uh, maybe look at how ecosystem-based approaches are, are being viewed as possible alternatives that need to be taken to scale. It's important probably to map out, first of all, that uh, Ireland, uh, if you have ever heard anything about it, it's a green island, and that's because it's got a lot of rain. But with climate change, driving uh, weather systems and temperatures going up, it means that we are probably going to get a lot more rain. And one of the problems that we're having is that uh, we're experiencing greater uh, risks of floods that uh, can damage both our agricultural system and our infrastructure. Uh, as a matter of fact, damaging floods in Ireland are expected to increase eight times over their uh, frequent uh, uh, level at the moment. Extreme flood events normally in Ireland happen about every 50 years. 
but now they're happening every 10. And in the last few years, we've had extreme floods in 2009 and 2013, and we had uh, very bad floods again in 2015 and 16. Uh, the, that most recent one um, was Storm Desmond uh, started that process. And that, that storm alone cost 150 million euros worth in damages, principally around the Shannon River Basin. The Shannon River is the biggest river in Ireland, and so it affects huge areas of agriculture and, and forestry and wetlands. So why is this happening to us now? Obviously, there's increased rainfall, but you would imagine that a country that is used to rain would have good runoff, but we've made some pretty big mistakes in the way we've managed our, our environment, and we need to maybe take a look at that a bit closer. In recent decades, urban and agricultural expansion and intensification has resulted in the loss of capacity uh, in, of our floodplains to absorb flooding. Uh, agricultural land use changes have reduced the permeability of the soils. Drainage and infilling of wetlands, poor use of our bogs, peat harvesting has all resulted in the loss of the natural flood water storage basins. Deforestation and land clearance, bare soils, and minimal uh, vegetative uh, soils uh, all contribute, like uh, let's say when we have big open wide tilled fields, they all contribute uh, to our intensive farming system, but at the same time they do little for the infiltration of water into the soil. Ireland has to maintain its ability to produce uh, food while managing flood risks. Ireland exports four times more food than we consume. So we're important in terms of our European context to, be, to provide food for the big cities that are not that far away from us. So I just maybe want to take one or two examples of things that we've looked at more recently and uh, of using eco-based approaches, ecosystem-based approaches. Let me talk about an area of Ireland that's a very sensitive area. It's, it's called the Burn and it's in the west of Ireland, and it's, uh, it's a region that's uh, actually acknowledged as a World Heritage Site, and it's home to more than 70% of Ireland's native fl uh, flora. It's a very sensitive area, very delicate area. The Burden Farming for Conservation program uh, recognizes that if the heathers on the hills are overgrazed, runoff will accelerate into uh, and contribute to the risk of flooding in the river basins. Equally though, the heathers need to be grazed, they need to be managed. However, our sheep farming in the Burden is a very old system. It's, the, it's documented and traced right back to over 10,000 years that farmers have been producing sheep in that area. And uh, this old agricultural system has found balance over these years, which we must maintain and be very sensitive with. To maintain this uh, system, farmers are paid a supplement to make sure that they don't overgraze it, that they don't try and expand their sheep numbers, that they, they go within parameters that are agreed and managed within that area. And then the burn is closely monitored. And if anyone has the chance to visit Ireland sometime, I really think it's a, it's a beautiful place to visit, but it's a really interesting uh, case to look at. Another e ecosystem initiative is underway in uh, Rogerstown town Estuary, just north of Dublin, not very far outside the city. And as you can imagine, uh, Dublin, like most cities that are on the coast, need seawall protection. And one of the things that uh, was decided in 2015 was for the Fingal County Council decided that they needed to address the issue of, of flooding and seawall protection. And one of the approaches was to actually lower the level of uh, an embankment, which was one and a half meters high, to, to lower it so that it would stretch us along the south bank of the river at least a kilometer of it, and that actually let the sea flood in at extremely high tides. Now this would, this would actually revert back to the kind of area it was in previous uh, times. Uh, the idea was that it allowed exceptionally high tides to flood onto several acres of, uh, of uh, level grassland. And the idea is to allow the natural process, processes, such as flooding and grazing, to take place and monitor how nature reacts to these processes. So for instance, before, herds of cattle and horses would be in targeted uh, penned areas or fields. Now they're allowed to range within this area, and it's quite an extensive area. 
and it means that there's a balance that they're trying to seek between the level of, uh, of cattle farming uh, combined with the regeneration of this in a flood defense, a flood protection risk management system. Natural flood management works on a catchment-wide scale to restore the natural ability of the land to regulate water flows and reduce flood risk. This integrated approach to flood risk management has many additional benefits in terms of economic viability, nature conservation, it contributes to water quality, and it's become a fantastic amenity because now these three and a half thousand hectares of land are actually, have become an area that people visit and, and are still very well managed. Participation of local communities in designing and implementing natural flood management is crucial and communities have often preferred natural flood risk alternatives to the traditional hard engineering solutions. Natural features such as wetlands, woodlands, bogs and floodplains are key features that contribute to natu natural flood management. Land use planning and land restoration are being effectively deployed to, show, to slow the flow of water on the catchment wide scale and in this way reduce flood risk. Another area is looking at forest cover and looking at the areas uh, at how you might promote that and I just want to mention this very, very briefly. Ireland has a, a plan to increase this forest cover uh, from 10.2% of our national territory, which is the current level of forestry, to 18.7% of our territory. And this is through the afforestation grant and uh, premium scheme. And a farmer can receive a grant of up to 5,700 euros uh, to, for, per hectare for the, for the, to establish native woodland and at the same time will receive six, up to 635 euros per year for 15 years to maintain those forests and those areas. I'm putting these out here as things that are still incipient. We don't have uh, uh, solutions, but these ones are particularly interesting to us. And I think we need to maybe look at this and see to what degree will this alternative be integrated into our risk management in terms of our broader program planning for the island. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. I think uh, you're really um, broadening the, the scope of possible measures that, that we have to address this issue in the agricultural landscape. So we heard here about mending mistakes of the past, uh, essentially re-engineering landscapes, the flows in the landscapes, and so on, to, to bring about these benefits whilst keeping uh, productive land. So that's indeed very encouraging. So I promised you uh, that at this moment I would uh, turn back to the floor and that, that's what um, we're going to do. Uh, what we've heard from our, our panel and from my co-chair is a lot about the needs. So we've heard that we, we need to get out of our silos, we need to uh, speak the same language, we need to have new partnerships, we need economic incentives to encourage behavioral change. Um, we need to reshape, rebalance the landscape. We heard this from Guatemala uh, as well as <coughs> Ireland. So, and we also heard that there's increasing pressure on, on this land, of course, so it, it's not easy. It, it's tough to change the way that this happens. So I would, in the next session, we need to address these needs. So what I, I would invite you to do uh, now in, in approximately 10 minutes is, is give me some key words because I'm going to go back to the panelists and explore a bit from their perspective, how do we scale up the good examples? How do we really bring these to the whole landscape? How do we tackle the, the really big issues instead of just collecting more and more small scale pilots? Uh, and to help me to do that, I would like you to suggest some topics. So I'm not asking you to, um, to elaborate the question. Uh, I'm not asking you, inviting you to give speeches, but I would like you to raise uh, just the topic that you would like me to explore with the panelists. So for example, it could be use of models to help understand uh, the risks in the landscape. 
this might be something you would like to hear about from the panels. So <coughs> I would like just to collect some of these uh, initial thoughts and uh, I'll, I'll gather um, what I can in the next 10 minutes and then we'll have the discussion and then we will come back to you again. Yes, I see a hand up uh, here. I think there's a microphone to help. Oh, okay. I will come to you uh, further back next. Yes, please. Hi. Um, my name is Sakila Kokietso. I work for the Convention on Biological Diversity Secretariat in Montreal. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, all the speakers for the good examples. Um, and just to highlight that the CBD has taken several decisions, including the most recent one um, at COP13. Um, on climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. What I would, I would like to ask the panelists to think about um, is the limits of ecosystems um, and also scenarios. So a lot, when we were doing our technical study on experiences with ecosystem-based adaptation, one of the things that came up strongly was scenario planning. So is there some... some uh, experience on scenario planning. Okay, that's fine. Thinking about limits. Thank you very much. Yes, this lady halfway on the left hand side, yes. She has to give you the head. Thank you very much. My name is Daria Moknachova. I work for the International Organization for Migration. Um, my organization is very much concerned with uh, the risk of displacement of people. Um, associated with disasters. And so we are now uh, exploring very seriously uh, the idea of community-based ecosystem management as a way to strengthen livelihoods while reducing physical risks of displacement and disasters, and so as to contribute to preventing displacement, uh, to supporting disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, and therefore contributing to the implementation of all key global processes such as the agenda, uh, 2030 agenda for SDGs, the Sendai framework, the Paris Agreement, and the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants. So my question would be, how can communities be better involved in ecosystem management? Do you have any examples um, and of how it could positively impact communities? And what can we do to support this? Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, could I ask you to? Um, try to focus on the, the theme of this particular session. Uh, we will take these questions, but it is about ecosystems in uh, agricultural landscape and, and the integration of these. Thanks. Uh, yes, the man in the red shirt and then the one in front of him. Hello, Dan Stothart, uh, UN Environment. A lot of your presentations have been about the effect particularly of weather on agriculture and agricultural productivity. And one of the things that seems to be missing from the debate is how agriculture itself can be a generator of risk which then affects ecosystems and then affects agricultural productivity. An example which will be very familiar to uh, the presenter from Guatemala, for example, the pesticide spill in Rio de la Pasión in Petén in 2015, which contaminated 30 kilometers of river and affected 6,000 people, which then obviously affected the aquatic ecosystem and the livelihoods of the people who depended on that river for fishing. A similar event happened in El Salvador as a result of a spill of molasses into a river. So to what degree do the panelists feel that we could be broadening the debate out to look not only at agriculture effectively as a victim of weather-related events, but also agriculture sometimes as a part of the generator of the risks and damage which then ecosystems and ecosystem users suffer? Yes, thank you. Um, that, that is indeed the framing of this event. Um, so we will include that. And the gentleman just in front of him. Thank you. Colin McQuiston from Practical Action. Um, I, I enjoyed the panel presentation, and I particularly like the spectrum from the techno fix that we saw from the example from your co-chair through to the nature-based fix that Adrian was talking about, about reversing previous engineering solutions. The question I've got for the panel is, how do we stop ecosystems and nature-based approaches as being externalities to the way that economists look at the landscape? How can we get ecosystems central to the way that decision makers make decisions about how we use the land? Thank you. Excellent question. Yes, this gentleman at the front. 
Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Francois Grunewald. I'm uh, from a research center, but I'm also a farmer myself. Um, I think we are missing the political economy of, uh, of, of the question. Why are peatland burning all the time in Kalimantan? It's because big companies are grabbing the land of indigenous co uh, communities and transforming it into uh, oil pine plantation. Why are so many areas being uh, the coastal area been deforested and then leaving the mangrove out of its protection role is because big companies are producing shrimps. So I think we cannot get only through technical issues and the nice uh, views of managing uh, ecosystem. We have to put it in very crude political uh, terms. Big companies are taking important land and transforming, transforming it in arid land for profit. And if we want to use land for land use for protecting environment in the mangrove if in many other areas, we have to go to that economical uh, area. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll just take one more question, and we will come back to the audience. So, don't panic. Yes, please at the front. Thank you very much. I'm Silla uh, Janssen from the Netherlands Partners for Resilience. I want to um, add something to the points that were made on the um, economic impact as well as the, uh, the political point. Um, my question is how can we link these approaches to uh, ecosystems in with agricultural policy on the regional level? For example, when we're talking about uh, Ireland and a European policy on agriculture, which is affecting not only the European continent, but also um, countries in, uh, in Africa where, to which we are also exporting uh, agricultural products. Um, and linking into this, um, uh, how are the regional platforms in other parts of the world in terms of economics and politics uh, willing to take this into account uh, when large economic interests are also at stake? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much everybody. I think uh, you'll agree we, we gathered a rich array of questions which just demonstrate um, the significance of this topic and also the breadth of the topic um, because you're all uh, coming to it from different uh, angles. Uh, so now I'm going to challenge the panel to pick up uh, some of these issues, um, drawing on their own experience but as far as possible um, leading us towards some priorities that we might flag up at the end of this session. Um, as the, the kind of most urgent and important priorities to take forward in the next couple of years. So we need to get quite specific um, with these. So I'm wondering um, where to start, but I think maybe let, let's take this question about um, agriculture uh, creating risks to ecosystems in the, in the landscape, which in turn is undermining productivity of the smallholders and livelihoods and the need to turn that around. Maybe I could um, ask both uh, Ronnie and uh, Adrian to, to give a small comment on that. And in answering, could you please identify uh, what is the critical measure in your experience? Um, what, what's the thing that can turn that around? Uh, Ronnie, would you like to go first? Bueno, eh, por supuesto que hay desplazamiento de, de personas cuando hay desastres naturales, pero tenemos que eh, buscar una forma de mitigar los, los desastres. Hemos estado confundiendo los suelos forestales con los suelos agrícolas en muchas partes del, del mundo. Creo que quitamos bosques para dedicarlo a agricultura cuando las pendientes son muy fuertes, entonces nosotros mismos provocamos la erosión. Tenemos que capacitar a nuestros campesinos, a nuestros agricultores. Eh, la, en la mayoría de, de casos, los agricultores son las víctimas, pero no los miremos solo como víctimas, miremoslos como posibles eh, fuentes de solución al problema, porque un agricultor capacitado eh, va a saber dónde realizar sus prácticas. La importancia de la focalización geográfica de las tierras es eh, donde nosotros podemos darnos cuenta dónde ofrecer eh, 
incentivos para la regeneración de los bosques y de qué forma, si solo bosques o vamos a mixtear bosques y agricultura. Basados esto siempre en los ecosistemas y mostrar resultados de impacto también para atraer fondos y más inversión. La institucionalización y la incorporación de la reducción de riesgos a desastres en la planificación del desarrollo sectorial son cruciales para lograr la mayor escala. Por ejemplo, los, para nosotros los sistemas agroforestales, como lo son el Cuxurrum, el Aliramón, el Pinabete en nuestro país y otros, otras, otras modalidades han sido, institucional, han sido institucionalizados e incorporados en el programa de incentivos forestales. Nosotros en Guatemala manejamos dos tipos de incentivos forestales. Manejamos eh, para pequeños poseedores de tierra, o sea, para los eh, campesinos que tienen solo un, un, un pedazo de tierra pequeño y para los grandes extensionistas que también tenemos el programa de incentivos forestales que este año lo estamos inaugurando que se llama ProBosque donde vienen diferentes modalidades, estamos incorporando eh, la modalidad agroforestal, o sea, queremos recuperar todas las áreas boscosas, eh, evitar las erosiones, reducir el riesgo de desastres, pero eh, el agricultor realmente no tiene los suficientes fondos para hacerlo, entonces estamos eh, buscando la forma de que ellos lo hagan recibiendo un incentivo pero como el, el, la recuperación de los bosques es muy tardado, lo estamos eh, mezclando con los cultivos agrícolas. Es de ahí donde estamos nosotros sacando eh, las modalidades de agroforestería dentro de nuestros programas de recuperación de tierras. Gracias. Incentives to enable those smallholders who are themselves affected to change around the landscape. Um, is it the same story uh, in Ireland, Adrian, or do you have some other measures? Yeah, I would uh, very much be in agreement with that. I think without incentives, uh, it's hard to bring about change, and I think people must see uh, options and alternatives and be encouraged to take a particular direction. But allow me to add to that a little bit. I think there's a huge issue here as well about raising awareness more broadly in, in, in the public. And you will, I'm, I dare say, have noted uh, recently that people are very conscious now about you know, the, the importance of a healthy diet and of, of healthy food and, and of making sure that what they're uh, eating is, is actually produced in a, in a way that's good for them and good for where they live and their environment. So I think the more that that message gets out, that's key and it's very important because then the issue of traceability, where does this product come from? How was it produced? To what degree is it undermining our own uh, ability to sustain our, our environment and our agriculture in the long run? And then I suppose there's a third element that would be very important. We need to, to make sure that our research base is sufficient, that we understand exactly what's happening with our ecosystems and our agricultural systems, and to do it in such a way that we can assess the degree of vulnerability and how we might be able to address this and include it into our future planning processes. Okay, thank you, Adrian. So we've heard about the need to raise awareness, sensitize, uh, government perhaps to the, the need for introducing ecosystem-based approaches and better understanding the risks across the landscape. So this speaks to, to the, the need to bring knowledge to the fore. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Margarita, whether you would like to comment on, on that aspect and perhaps also the one that was raised about uh, scenarios and how we can perhaps better marry scenarios for people and uh, agricultural landscapes and nature. Do you, what opportunities do, do you see um, in this area? Well, um, thank you. Um, um, you know, already earlier, I, uh, because when we made these introductory descriptions uh, about what's going on, Guatemala and Ireland, you both mentioned pressure on land, etc. But the pressure on land 
the land grabbing, the exploitation of land in a negative fashion is of course part of the picture. And I, I think one of our really serious challenges is that these conversations take place in different places. So in one area we sit and talk about the benefits of ecosystems management, but we avoid these tough issues that are threats to the ecosystems and the natural resource management in themselves because they are political and it becomes a different conversation. But I think that should really be a goal that we set ourselves to you know, nurture, convince um, different actors to look at the full picture. Otherwise, I don't think we can, even with the best of scenarios, I was going to say, to make vulnerabilities very obvious um, because there are threats that are controlled by forces that don't belong to our competences. And I think that's also the issue of how the externalities into economics. And we have gone through this same conversation for disaster risk reduction. And we've made some significant progress with business, finance, industry, through economic understanding of the cost, not only to society, but the cost to business, of not bringing in the externalities of, of uh, risk as it is. So I think this is important of start really working through the economics, the political elements uh, of this so that our conversation takes place in the context of also understanding the risk to doing what is obviously a necessity for, for risk. And I, I think that's where the modeling should be. And that n n requires bringing in different types of expertise to join forces with the expertise that, that our communities here have. So that would be my, uh, my um, reflection on that. And I think it's critical to make progress on the scale. Because when we talk about scale here, um, it's implicit that the scale can be done, but has not yet been done. So what's the barrier? And I think the barrier is there. It's, it's not the shortage of good examples of what can be done, but it's the lack of incentives and forcing, let's say, regulations and politics to scale for longer term sustainability. That's very interesting, uh, useful comment, I think, Margarita, because when we talk about mapping, um, better understanding the risks and opportunities in the landscape, I think we get stuck in our, in our silo of the biophysical world. Um, and occasionally we link it to the economic world. But I think what you're describing there is, a, is really the big picture, um, including the political will and, and society's acceptance for change perhaps. Um, so uh, this feels to me uh, very right, uh, but also very challenging. So uh, that, that's a, a proposition, I think, uh, from this panel that I, I'd like to test in a moment um, back to, to the room. Because I think this might lead us into a good direction for uh, a clear recommendation. But I heard, uh, Adrian, you were, you were nodding and, and agreeing, I think. Would you like to add to that uh, remark? Yeah, and I'd probably like to maybe identify two opportunities. Great. Uh, one opportunity is, and uh, I'm sure you're all very familiar with it, that under the Paris Agreement, there's the, the requirement to, to put in place um, nationally determined contributions, NDCs, and also this whole element of national adaptation plans and how we go about that. And I think this is an opportunity for us to actually really try and put forward the whole argument about the need to actually put ecosystems to the center of those two processes. Obviously, what, when you're trying to reduce emissions and trying to address the element of uh, uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you know, you're trying to deal with the ecosystem in that regard. But equally, in terms of adaptation planning, there's an opportunity to assure that the agriculture sector is adequately reflected there and that the ecosystems that need to be restored and protected and, and redeveloped, uh, uh, in our case, our, our peatlands, our wetlands, our bogs, uh, our woodlands, 
you know, that, that, that balance needs to be reachieved. And I think there's an opportunity there for us all to, in that iterative process of planning and replanning and, and putting into the implementation of national adaptation plans, to, to get our voice heard and to insert our discussion there. The second element I think that's very important, and I want to come back to the lady that, that spoke on this side, I think you're very right. You know, we have made mistakes with our agricultural planning in the past, and we need to correct that. And I think there's a call here on us now when we come in terms of the European Union, you know, the new common agricultural policy will be uh, put in place in, in 2020. But the discussion starts now. And we need in that policy to reflect that we will improve the management of our floodplains and our wetlands and the catchment features uh, around, let's say, the management of risk in our agriculture, but also to make sure that we are protecting biodiversity. Let me just say there, there's a very keen thing that we are hearing. We are hearing that the bee population is actually decimated and very, very rapidly reducing around the world, and its effect on our food could be dramatic. It's amazing to see how many farmers are encouraging people in Ireland, would you mind bringing your hive close to my fields? And I think this is an opportunity. This means that you say you bring your hive, that's good, but please don't spray them anymore. You know, so I think we have to look at these things, and I think the common agricultural policy is an area for us to raise these issues, as is the national adaptation plans, as is the other uh, frameworks that are appearing internationally. So as not to go on too long, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Adrian. Um, and um, Minister Nazarzada would like to also add a remark here. Уважаемые дамы и господа. Ну, Таджикистан – это одна из бывших стран бывшего Советского Союза. И в нашей стране процесс перехода от одной формы собственности в другую ну, сегодня еще продолжается. И вот э, население нашей страны, в основном сельское население страны, э, в развитии скотоводства видело как бы банк вложения денег в цель увеличения своего благосостояния. То есть тезис был простой – Чем больше поголовья скота, тем благосостояние твое, значит, лучше. И, к сожалению, вот такой подход привел э, к определенным негативным явлениям в сельской местности. Это и увеличение количества оползней, э, это и сходы снежных лавин, это и нарушение береговой линии горных рек. И поэтому вот, по, э, такой вот пример я вам приведу. В настоящее время реализуется международная организация Caritas, которая финансируется швейцарским офисом по развитию и сотрудничеству. Проект, который предусматривает это посадку деревьев на склонах гор, предгорной местности, что снижает риск бедствий. Эффект Данного мероприятия также заключается в том, что сегодня мы можем контролировать в этих регионах эрозию почвы, вопросы укрепления почвенного слоя, вопросы предотвращения оползней и повышения плодородности почвы. Кроме этого, рациональное управление пастбищами путем создания ассоциации пастбища пользователей Планирование и методика выпаса скота, создание постоянных точек водопоя в пастбищах привели к тому, что сегодня мы имеем конкретный процент снижения оползней в их процессов, а также значительно повысилась эффективность ведения сельского хозяйства, что, безусловно, привело к повышению уровня жизни в тех районах, где реализуются эти проекты. То есть практически то, что говорил вот мой коллега из Ирландии. Спасибо. Thank you very much, Minister, for, for that inspiring example. And indeed, you start to see some similarities between these examples from very different places, uh, situations in the world. So that encourage me, encourages me to think that we, we can shape some recommendations here which will have broad relevance, even though the design, in the end, the design of implementation needs to be very specific to uh, the local situation, of course. 
So I think, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to come back to you again, and uh, this time just to reflect back to you, um, I think three main recommendations that are coming out of this discussion with the panel that were based indeed on your questions and, and see whether they resonate with you and give you a chance to um, point out some remaining gaps uh, before we start a round of uh, really trying to get to some specific recommendations that go forward from the session. So um, the three that I've identified with the panel is that yeah, what's fundamentally needed is a, is a big picture mapping and scenario planning um, that brings in the, the tricky political issues and the economics, the costs of not doing uh, this well and the benefits of doing it well, to put it as Margarita did. And, and through that process, enabling sectors to work together on implementation. So that's the, the first area where we might uh, have a recommendation. The second is uh, about reshaping policies, regulations, and especially incentives as enablers of risk-informed planning and agricultural development. So this is to avoid aggravating the situation further and to encourage rebalancing of the use of, of the land and water resources uh, and use of, for example, green infrastructure through incentive schemes. Um, and the third very practical recommendation is, is around the area of national plans um, so the NDCs and, and the, the NAPs in the short term, um, and putting ecosystems at the center of those. So it could be that from Cancun there's a really strong push in that direction to encourage governments to be very active to, to put ecosystem measures in those plans at the national level, and that that would filter through to a range of sectoral policies. So I think these are three helpful suggestions. I'd like now to uh, gather in, yeah, we have to be quite quick, five, seven minutes, a few reactions. Um, please point out anything you feel is really missing and uh, we'll see if we can add it. Yes, this lady here is first. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ananet Atikesa from the National Anti-Poverty Commission Victims of Disaster and Calamities from the Philippines. Um, I would like to point out, like, uh, based on our experience, we are promoting uh, and having models already starting this integrated watershed and river basin management approach as uh, an approach that we aim to address uh, different aspects of protecting ecosystems, but at the same time, uh, addressing problems at the communities and the people. What we are confronted when we are promoting participatory process in this whole, pro in this whole ecosystems approach is because we believe without the people's participation, everything will fail. When we involve the community, they bring in very practical, problems, issues, and concerns. One, we may want to preserve and protect ecosystem, but practical uh, situation is people are also, if they are confronted with poverty and without alternative, then, and their alternative is only to, or main source of income is to cut trees, then we are confronted with the reality that whatever, however good our plans, are people in the mountains that the government cannot reach will continue to deforest the remaining forests that have been denuded by big logging companies before. And they said the poverty situation is actually created by those big logging companies because before they've been sustainable with the forest, but when the forest was gone, poverty has worsened. Second, uh, practical uh, issue that we have brought out is conflict. So I think there was not much mentioned about this, but much of our forests, 
areas have not been reached and regulated, it's because there's conflict. It cannot be easily accessed by government and the regulating body. So the community said, how can we regulate when we are not included in the protection? You're hiring forest guards from the city who don't even could not easily come here because of fear of conflict or fear of elements that are uh, believed to be outlaws. Third, uh, third practical uh, I'm issue. Really, I'm really sorry, but I, yes, I, sir. I didn't invite yes. uh, a, a speech. Could, could you just please give a, a very short recommendation yes. because I'd like to give some other suggestions. Yes, just one last point. Last practical issue is on political boundary. So ecosystems management is, we believe, transcends political boundary. But the problem at the local level, they government operates in silos. So participatory process in governance policy is very important. But the problem always is there is limited resources to support participatory process of the government of the, of the community. Thank One you. specific uh, like model that we have tested is this payment for ecosystem services that we can generate from private sector from all those who have benefited from the use of these resources but this is not really widely still a practice and we hope that we can really promote this and secondly we hope that international funding we really see to it that when we protect ecosystems we really would we really would see to it that communities needs are addressed thank you okay thank you for your statement and your passion um, i'd like to go to the lady at the back there who earlier had a hand up. Yes, thanks. And uh, I can just take one more after that, I think, um, because I'm then going back to the panel to ask them to make their, their final uh, recommendation. Thank you so much, uh, co-chairs and the panelists. I'm Nusrat Nasab, and I'm uh, representing Akhan Development Network. When it comes to agro uh, ecosystem, two things comes to mind. One is habitat, and the other comes livelihood. And I will particularly focus on uh, the mountain uh, system where we cannot really generalize the agriculture uh, practices. Uh, when it comes to uh, natural resource management, agriculture cannot be taken as standalone. It has to come with water management, forest management, and livestock management, and then agriculture management. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And yes, one last remark here. This lady with the red top. Thank you very much for your inputs, very interesting. I would just suggest related to your very first point you mentioned that when we do the big picture, normally in the DRR community we are used to analyze hazards and vulnerability and sometimes we forget to define what is really what we want to protect. So what is the protection goal? That is a political process that needs to be inclusive, but really puts emphasis on, on what are the crucial elements in, in that bigger picture to be protected. Is it the forest? Is it the wetland? Is it whatever it is? But not only to look at those hazard and vulnerability side, but to look more and more on, on what is really the protection goal where we want to allocate uh, scarce resources. Thanks. Excellent point, thank you. So what I heard from these interventions uh, very strongly was the absolute need for stakeholders to be involved in every stage of, uh, of the process, um, from design to implementation. We heard again the need for more intersectoral uh, collaboration. And um, thank you for the last point, because it, it, it brings me back to my introduction, where um, it, it is true that natural infrastructure ecosystems uh, are defined as part of the critical infrastructure. But in practice, um, they are overlooked in the landscape. So in mapping terms, in understanding the landscape, 
this, this element hasn't come forward. And that might be something that we want to pick up in our recommendation from the session. So thanks for that. Uh, I'm now going to come back to um, each of the panelists and ask them very succinctly to make um, one final remark, which I hope will be in the form of a recommendation. Um, so I'll start with you, Adrian, and then we'll, we'll work along this way. Thanks very much. I'm glad people are very, very clear on this issue of community participation, and I'm glad that uh, uh, in that regard that that we place emphasis on people's participation in this, and particularly the participation of women. I think it's very, very important in, in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world as well. I'd like to say that I think land use planning and land restoration right, is a, a very key element that we need to consider when we're, when, we're, when we're putting forward our recommendations and to make sure that it's integrated into what we do. And that's not only just in terms of flood risk management in Ireland, it's also true in terms of feasibility for retention of moisture for crop production or recharging or aquifers in semi-arid conditions or water-stressed areas, even like Ethiopia. There's some magnificent experiences there that we don't have time to go into today, but they're definitely areas that I think they're showing the way as how to work on this. So, I think governments have to consider integrating disaster risk ma management into policy planning more broadly and put in place the package of incentives and supports to farmers and communities so that we can scale ecosystem protection but also ensure that we integrate it into sustainable agriculture, climate resilient agriculture, a, a way to continue having good food that nourishes us all and does it in a fashion that doesn't add to our risks. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I'll go to Margarita because we're coming back to our co-chair right at the end for his remarks. Um, maybe two, uh, three short points. The first one is, um, I remember from uh, the discussions on the Sendai framework, one of the member states, one very large member state, asked us when we started, or you started suggesting natural resource management, ecosystems-based management, the gentleman just asked, can you explain to me what's the advantages of an ecosystem-based management rather than any old management that we are doing now? Luckily, we could give examples from his country that they're already doing it, but I think that's, you know, that's the kind of question that we should have a very clear manifestation and explanation, this is what you get. That's an observation. So just to go to what I did, I was trying to imagine what this big picture process could be when I was sitting here listening to you. And I, I think um, uh, it's an issue of getting political champions to help us with that. Uh, and it will not exclude um, the, the comments from the colleague from Philippines about illegal logging. These are in the threats domain uh, about conflict that prevent access and actually helps illegal logging and destruction. So, so it really is part of that picture that we need to bring together. But um, having said that, I asked this community of passionate experts in various areas of environment, biodiversity, to not go away and think that this is something that somebody else will do. You will have to be part of that process and engage in how you use the instruments that your communities own to bring to the table to see how they fit together. And just as a concrete, finally, example of that, um, Adrian mentioned the national plans, the NDCs, the NAPAs. The target E in Sendai actually demands that countries should have national and local plans for risk management by 2020. We've got three years to go. So obviously these plans should be well integrated with what already is happening on, on similar areas. So I think we have the instruments. It's the process to bring it together that I think we should give time to. Thank you, uh, Margarita. And uh, finally, could I come to uh, Ronnie uh, Granados for your final remarks? 
Bueno, yo creo que es tiempo de hacer un, un alto y meditar. Creo que hemos cometido ya muchos errores. El cambio climático ya viene y los desastres con él también. Nuestra capacidad para erradicar el hambre y la alimentación a una población creciente para el 2030 depende de fomentar las habilidades únicas de agricultores, pescadores, pastores y comunidades dependientes de los bosques para producir alimentos y administrar el medio ambiente en el que todos dependemos. El sector agrícola es la clave para la reducción de, de riesgos de desastres. Es un sector severamente impactado, estamos hablando de un 23% aproximadamente de las pérdidas y daños por desastres naturales en países en vías de desarrollo. Pero es también parte de la solución. Los agricultores no son solo víctimas, tienen también un importante potencial para prevenir o reducir los impactos de los desastres. Por ello necesitan ser empoderados y capacitados. Quiero hacer un énfasis en que las comunidades que dependen de la agricultura, ganadería, pesca y bosques, no solo producen alimentos, son también cuidadores de, nuestros medios, de nuestro medio ambiente. Gracias. So, uh, these are the clear recommendations of uh, the panelists. On the one hand, we need plans and incentives. Um, on the other hand, we also need to engage the stakeholders and really empower uh, the stakeholders to, to take care of their land and, and water resources. But at the bigger picture level, we need political champions. Um, maybe it's something we could trigger through a forum like this, actually to get a group of countries who say, look, we could actually work together to, to tackle these issues, to bring together the expertise and to build some momentum on this topic. Um, that's a, a very nice thought. I would like just to add um, one other thought um, for recommendation, and, and that would be that uh, we could encourage governments to first consider green or natural infrastructure solutions in the context of reducing disaster risks, and then consider the need for hard or grey solutions in addition rather than uh, how it is now, which is usually only the, the grey hard solutions. So um, to give first consideration to green infrastructure as a means to reduce disaster risks at a landscape scale, um, and of course to provide the su support in the ways uh, the other recommendations uh, spell out. So um, that concludes our panel session and our discussion. So I appreciate very much uh, engaging with, with yourselves from the audience. And uh, thanks very much for a very pleasurable session from my point of view. But I'd like to invite my co-chair, um, His Excellency Minister Nazazoda, to uh, close the session. Небольшую рекомендацию дать. Наверное, очень важно является то, что мы научили наших фермеров правильно и рационально использовать то богатство, которое дает нам природа. Это, наверное, задача правительства и тех международных организаций, которые работают в этой сфере. Уважаемые коллеги, я в завершении нашей сегодняшней сессии хочу поблагодарить всех участников панели всех тех, кто принял очень активное участие с мест за те правильные и грамотные предложения, которые были с вашей стороны высказаны. И я уверен, что то, что мы сегодня сделали, мы сделали хорошую работу, это будет вкладом в итоговый документ нашего глобального форума, который проходит в Канкуне. Также я хочу поблагодарить наших переводчиков, за их прекрасную работу, которую создали здесь атмосферу взаимопонимания и контакта. На этом работа нашей сегодняшней сессии, работу я объявляю открытой. Всем желаю здоровья, успехов и благополучно доехать до своих мест, до дома. Всего доброго. Спасибо.